it's nice to have the opportunity to present again to the European Institution Society, even if only virtually. I'm going to talk about short-term versus long-term strategies for studying rare cetaceans, focusing on our work with Hawaiian Adonises, and give what I think is probably the best example of how a long-term approach can be critical in providing information on rare species. Before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that uh, it's a long-term study. This work has been funded by a wide variety of sources over the years. It's relied uh, on a very strong team of researchers in the field, as well as folks working back in the office with catalogs and data sets, and also critically with a lot of important collaborations and contributions from community scientists. Now, when research starts on marine mammals in any particular area, it typically focuses on the species that are easiest to study. It may be ones that are found really close to shore, really easy to detect. Also often focuses on the sexiest species or species that have really obvious conservation concerns, such as those that were subjected to commercial whaling. Don't get me wrong, there's been tremendous advances in the last 20 years on some very poorly known species and groups. The best example, perhaps, is the beaked whales, the second most species family of Adonisites. Beaked whale research, spurred on by concerns over Navy sonar, has increased dramatically in the last 20 years, and now some of these species are among the most well-known species of Adonisites in the world rather than the least known. But many oceanic species are still extremely poorly known. A great example of this are pygmy killer whales. They're naturally rare. They're found primarily in deep waters offshore in the tropics and subtropics. They're difficult to find in the first place and often very difficult to work with when they are found. They're easily confused with melon-headed whales. Most publications of this species in the last 20 years have been simply of single strandings or sightings, and, and they remain one of the least known species of delphinids in the world. I think there are several reasons why this continues to be the case, some of which are due to choices that we as researchers make when we start a study or when we modify or update our protocols over time. One of the most obvious choices is just which species to study, whether we focus on just a single species or on multiple species. Another factor influencing this relates to how surveys are undertaken. Many researchers, usually for very good reasons, use line transect methodology to survey areas using distance sampling to estimate abundance and examine density. Such an approach has obvious value in many circumstances, but it's not the most appropriate in all cases. And it comes with costs, including lost opportunity costs, for example, when weather conditions allow for working in areas farther offshore. Another reason I've heard researchers use for not pursuing broadening a study is while waiting for funding. While recognizing that a variety of circumstances have led to the flexibility, in our case, to study many species right from the start in Hawaii, we've taken a, a multi-species approach regardless of what species we were funded to work with and, and effectively undertaken pilot projects in one year while funded to work on other species or topics has led to funding in subsequent years to work with those other species. Here I show a progression of what we were funded for in particular years versus what we actually worked on. Our funding in 2000, for example, was to work with humpback whales. We did work with humpbacks, but we also worked with false killer whales, short fin pilot whales, pantropical spotted spinner and bottlenose dolphins. That work with bottlenose dolphins allowed us to set up a sample that we could use the next year in 2001 for a study that we were funded to work with bottlenose dolphins. And that led in the year after to working off a different island, again funded primarily to work with bottlenose dolphins, but also to work with shortfin pilot whales, where we worked with a whole suite of species. Importantly, both Blainville's and Cuvier's beaked whales. We created a, a baseline uh, behavior and some tag data from those species in both 2002 and 2003, and that allowed us in 2004 to get funding to work with beaked whales. Since then, we've continued this approach. While we've really had funding to actually photo-identify false killer whales, we built up the catalog to a point that in 2005 we were able to get funding to analyze the data and produce the first abundance estimate for this population. Similarly, we've started the satellite tagging work in 2007 with just a few tags and used our early success with tagging to obtain funds to purchase more tags and eventually get support for the tagging work itself. 
During our study, we've encountered 21 different species, and while the most frequently encountered species have often been the subject of graduate degrees, including PhDs on shortfin pilot whales, pantropical spotted dolphins, and rough-toothed dolphin population genetics, a master's degree on shortfin pilot whale social organization, and a master's degree on bottlenose dolphin movements and association patterns. Arguably, the contributions on some of the less frequently encountered species have been more consequential in terms of contributing to what is known of those species worldwide. I'm going to focus on dwarf sperm whales, both because it's one of my favorite species and also one of the best examples of this approach, but also mention some of the other rare species that this approach has been extremely valuable for. Now, this is from a paper that we published last year on site fidelity, spatial use, and behavior of dwarf sperm whales in Hawaiian waters. Perhaps the most exciting finding from this work was the discovery that some individuals are resident to the island. This individual shown here has been seen in eight different years over a 15-year span. Adult female that's been documented with several calves over that period. If you look at the sightings of that particular female, they're all clustered in a relatively small area off the west side of the island. Compared to the rest of the sightings from the island, they're uh, much more clustered, suggesting that individuals have relatively small home ranges. Now, from photographs, as well as using it to look at re-sightings of individuals, we've also been able to document a lot of other useful information about the ecology and interactions with humans for this species. So, for example, in the left-hand side, you can see four different individuals that have survived wounds from attacks from large sharks. And in the bottom right, you can see a number of individuals that have evidence of interactions with humans, whether it's line wraps or, in one case, an animal that may have been hit by a vessel. While our survey effort is clearly not systematic by any means, from this broad distribution of effort, we've been able to quantify that individuals from this population seem to preferentially use the slope waters of the island. In terms of the social network, while it's very sparse, and we can't really say much about social organization per se, we are able to use this social network to look at other types of parameters for this population. So, for example, the individuals that are in this main cluster of the social network are found on average in shallower water than those that are not linked to any other individuals or to the, to the main cluster. Individuals that are seen multiple times are found in, on average in shallower water. And, and both of these suggest that these individuals are part of a resident slope-dwelling population, but there's also an overlapping pelagic or open ocean population that uses the same area. We've also used drones to study the species. We use them to help stay with groups or individuals for longer, allowing us to get better photographs or photographs of a higher proportion of the individuals in a group. We've used it to examine behavior that seems to be primarily vigilance behavior, looking behind them for sharks before they come up to the surface. And we've used them to document social behavior. So all of these methods are incredibly valuable for understanding this poorly known species. Prior to our work, the only researcher in Hawaii who was regularly taking photos of some of these rare species was Dan McSweeney. So we worked with Dan to digitize all of his slides and negatives, which extended our catalogs for some species back by 15 years, instantly creating some of the longest-term catalogs for species like pygmy killer whales, false killer whales, and cuviers and Plainville's beaked whales. For some of these species, we also get a lot of community science contributions of photographs, allowing us to fill in details on their social organization and population structure, identifying both insular and pelagic populations, some of which overlap, and revealing details on their behavior. With pygmy killer whales, for example, in our 64 encounters and in even more encounters by Dan and community members, they've never been documented feeding during the day, suggesting they feed primarily, if not entirely, at night. So to conclude, I hope I've shown that this long-term approach can be an extremely valuable one when it comes to studying rare species, and that will be adopted more broadly in other areas, working with multiple species, not just one or two, taking advantages of unusual weather windows to get farther offshore, and when rare species are encountered, taking advantage of those opportunities. Given that they are rare, a collaborative approach is clearly needed, and working with other researchers as well as community scientists, I think, is the best way forward to learning more about some of these very poorly known oceanic species. Thanks very much for listening.